Hello, how are you? Good. How about yourself? I'm just okay. Good, good. Okay. And, uh, how are you, Pastor Mukweya? I'm fine. And how are you? I'm just okay. Thank you. Very good. Okay. Very good. Um, we won't, we, I already started recording just as you were coming on, Frank. So uh, already we are recording and I'll put it on to uh, YouTube. So that'll be handy. Um, and if you remember, we're continuing from our last lesson. We talked about Mark chapter 2, verse 1 to 12. Um, Jesus, well, before we get too far, let me start with a prayer, please. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to be together. I realize that both of these men there in Blantyre are, are, are just busy, busy. And I appreciate very much that they are able to take some time to join with me as we study together your holy word. As we look today at some kind of training, what, what training is needed for various forms of ministry, we ask you to bless our study that we speak openly, we speak freely, we are comfortable, um, and and uh, we understand, most importantly, your Holy Spirit helps us to understand what you are trying to tell us in your Holy Word. We ask your blessings on all we say and do today to your glory. Amen. 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 Okay, so my question is, who remembers what we studied? What is in Mark chapter 2, verse 1 to 12? Anybody? Yeah, you can look in your Bible. That's fine. <laughs> All right. Uh, in in Mark chapter two, verse one to twelve, um, we have an instance where Jesus was teaching in the uh, in the in one house. Yep. In fact, in his hometown. Yeah. And in, uh, we are told of the four men uh, who brought a paralytic man to be healed by Jesus. But since they couldn't get to Jesus through the door, they had to go on the roof, make a hole and lower the person. Um, and in, from there, we see Jesus performing a miracle, uh, healed the man and at the same time, he offered the man the greatest gift, which is forgiveness of sin. Yeah. And from there, we, uh, we also hear the, these teachers of the law and the Pharisees getting angry because Jesus has said, your sins have been forgiven. They thought he, he is blaspheming because he is not God himself. It is only God who forgives sins, but who is this fellow? Yeah, so yeah, there are a number of things I've just mentioned with yeah. you. Right. Yeah, it's, a, I mean, it, it, there's a lot in that story. Um, the question before us is what miracle did Jesus do that we, that is, us as Christians, we can still do today? Healing. What kind of healing? <laughs> a paralyzed man and the forgiving is see. Aha. Uh -huh. Probably well, let's read let's read this. Um maybe Pastor McQuay, can you read this? Do you see it well? Yes. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you don't forgive them, they are not forgiven. John okay. 20, 21, 23. Excellent. Very good. So Jesus gives, 
Christians, any Christian, the authority to forgive sins or to announce the forgiveness of sins to people. Maybe, uh, <coughs> Frank, can you read this one? Okay. We do not have a specific promise that we can heal a paralytic <coughs> as Jesus did in Mark 2. In the scriptures, however, we see that Jesus performed an even greater miracle by announcing to the man that his sins were forgiven. See especially verses 5 to 9. In John 20, verse 21 to 23, we see that we have the same authority given by Jesus to ministers of his church to proclaim to others that their sins are forgiven. The same message Jesus announced to the paralytic. So, go back to uh, Frank's answer. He talked about the paralytic, but especially because I don't know how to heal paralytics. <laughs> to be honest with you, I don't know what I would do with that as far as taking away their physical ailment. But what kind of healing can we do? Spiritual healing. Yeah, yeah, spiritual healing to encourage them with that message of forgiveness of sins in Jesus. Um, Frank, can you read this question? Suppose your group of believers wanted to call someone to visit people facing illness, pain, or death. What is the most important assurance a person in this capacity would want to share with the people he visited? What kind of person might serve in this way? So there really are two questions here. Um, maybe Pastor Mukweya has, has some thoughts. I don't want to put you on the spot. If you don't have some thoughts, it just, you can say, I don't have any thoughts. Yeah. Um... Taking the first one is, um, what is the most important assurance? <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> yeah, the, the, the most important assurance is um, to tell someone that he has got a very good relationship in terms of saying that he, his sins have been forgiven. I think that's that's the the most important assurance one number one to hear because he can be healed but if he his sins are not forgiven then the relationship or heaven heaven's door is not open for that person so the the, the best thing or the best assurance is the forgiveness of sins because that brings us closer to god okay frank do you agree Yes, uh, partly I will agree, but I was of the view that uh, first thing uh, should have been the physical hearing because the person is, and the, 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 the people are facing several uh, illnesses, different illnesses, pains or death. So, the first thing should be uh, physical healing, then seconded by forgiveness of sins, as you have learned from our passage. Yeah, if we look back at the passage, what healing did Jesus offer first as a matter of priority? Physical healing. I don't think so. 
the for the forgiveness of sins. Yeah. In the first place, he said, "Your sins are forgiven." And these men were saying, "What? What are you? What are you saying? You can't forgive sin." Then he said, "Okay, so that you should know that I have authority. Then now I'm 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 doing this second thing. Take uh, pick up your mat and go." But he started with the the forgiveness of sins. Right. Uh and I, and I think this is important. Um, it's an important point because, you know, if, well, I don't like what if questions, but what if Jesus forgave him his sins and he died? <laughs> his sins were forgiven and then he died. Then what would happen to him? I think it may, maybe the, those people uh, surrounding wouldn't have faith in him. Just, just a suggestion. <laughs> no, no, uh, thanks. I think you're. I think that's a good point, Frank. Um, but if the man dies without the forgiveness of sins, we know where does he go. Hell. Hell. Yeah, but if he dies with the forgiveness of sins, he goes to heaven. In life. <laughs> right, he goes to heaven. So um, maybe uh, that can be something for us to think about when, well, I know, I know, for example, in our um, some of our other churches where we do some sort of humanitarian aid, in order to get in order to get something for that humanitarian aid, the first thing, number one, most important, we have devotion with them. And we make them to know who Jesus is. Obviously, it's the work of the Holy Spirit to put faith in their heart, but but if they don't hear the word of God, then they don't know Jesus, their sin is not forgiven. So always we try to maintain that priority uh, when we're doing humanitarian aid. Certainly it is important to heal where we can heal, provide food or medicine, um, <clears throat> clothes maybe. Yeah, humanitarian aid is very important. But it is a result of our faith. It is not the thing that causes faith. Does that sound, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Think about it. Think about it just a little bit. <laughs> Um, the, so the next question is a good one, too. What kind of person might be able to go and visit people and remind them, encourage them, uh, inform them about how Jesus died for their sins and their sins are forgiven? What kind of person can do that? Uh, a yeah, public a, a public minister. Okay, that's a good that's a good terminology to use. Public minister. What were you going to say, Pastor McQuaya? Uh, yes, I will look. Looking at the passage, we have already from yeah, it should be authority being given to all believers to. To promise the forgiveness of sins. So, yeah, uh, for the church as the church it stands, yes, uh, the, the public ministers, uh, uh, the public ministers there to do that. But he, the responsibility lies in the hands of every believer. Ah, good. Okay, good point. Great point. And that's that's why I was very interested to hear Frank say public minister because. If you if the congregation is going to call somebody, 
uh, maybe have to underline that word the next time I teach that this lesson. They wanted to call somebody to visit people. So you are a visiting elder. We use that term. I think, do we use that? Visiting elder? Yes. We, we make somebody. And I think, Frank, you made a very good point. This would be somebody, some a public minister, somebody who's been given a call on behalf of the congregation. Please go and visit um, uh, Mrs. Banda, Mrs. Jones, whoever whoever needs to be visited. You do that on behalf of the congregation. At the same time, uh, Pastor McQuaya makes a very important point as well. You don't have to have a call to encourage somebody with the forgiveness of sins. That's a private ministry. But if you have a call, maybe the question is more about who should get that call? Who would you look for? If you wanted to have a visiting elder at Beautiful Savior, what do you look for? So a quick question again. Yeah. <laughs> what kind of what kind of character? Maybe that's the word. I don't know. What kind of character? Or what do you look for in a person? <clears throat> if at beautiful save you want you want to call a visiting elder, what do you look for? Uh, someone who is brainless, who is a, uh, who has got a good character, who read by example. Um, okay. with, uh, with his family. Uh, yeah, I think it, uh, or if I did. <laughs> nice. No, you're you're listing exactly what Paul wrote to First Timothy, wrote in First Timothy chapter yes. uh, chapter three, right? Yes. yes. Um maybe Pastor Mukwea, can you read this in the blue? Yes. What uh, <coughs> what the people this code waker would visit would need the most is the security of forgiveness of sins. The first step to finding a person to carry out this task would be to identify people among you who have gifts to serve in this way. The next step would be to ensure that the person has the necessary Bible training to carry out the task. Right. So what, what Frank was talking about is identifying people who have gifts to serve in this way. They're well respected. Uh, their, their family is well organized and coming to church. Um, things like that. The next step now, and, and maybe you want to think about this. I'm just in my own mind. It's not in First Timothy chapter 3. But maybe you want somebody who is, is free to talk. You know, somebody's very shy. I don't like to talk to people. Um, I don't, maybe I don't like to even leave my house. Uh, or I don't know how to, I don't know how to dress well, things like that. Those are all worldly things, but in some ways they'll be helpful. If somebody's good at talking and they're free and they're comfortable, um, that's one thing. But I think obviously Frank's ideas are more important. They're, they're blameless, they're well-respected, uh, they're active in church, all those kinds of things. Then we talk about training. Okay. Um, so talk about understanding how to begin training a minister. Remember, a minister. The word minister. Well, let me ask. What do you what do you know about a minister? What is a minister? How do you define that?
a minister, a savior, or the one who saves others. Yeah, yeah, okay. A servant, a servant, right. So we're going to look for, we want to train a servant. Um, let's read First Timothy, Second Timothy chapter 1, verse 5. Go ahead. Frank, can you read this? I am reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother, Louise, and in your mother, Eunice. And I am persuaded now. I am persuaded now lives in you also. Okay. So what's the first qualification that Paul looked for in Timothy? Faith. Faith. Excellent. Yeah. Yeah. Um, maybe a little bit straightforward. Maybe we were looking. But of course, uh, maybe we were looking beyond that. But for sure, let's start there. Uh, Pastor Mukwea, can you read 2 Timothy 3, verse 15? And how from infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures, which you are able to make, uh, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. Okay, good, good. So what's the second qualification that Paul found in Timothy? Knowing scripture. Knowing the scriptures. Exactly. So faith in the heart and knowledge in the brain. Um, and certainly the Holy Spirit brings faith through that knowledge. So um, again, Frank, I'll come back to you. Can you read this in green? Timothy. Timothy's instruction apparently began rooted in the Holy Scripture scriptures at home with his mother and grandmother. Yeah. That instruction in the Old Testament began long before he met Paul. Timothy then heard Paul's message of the resurrected Jesus. Okay, good. Um, I, I would probably underline uh, that instruction began long before he met Paul. So uh, whether, whether you have a long history with somebody or not is not the most important thing. The important thing is, how long have you known the scriptures? Somebody who is raised in the church will be a better option than somebody who's just now coming into the Christian faith. I think that's I think that's what we're trying to say. That's one of the points. Good. Okay. Uh, we don't. I don't have this passage, but maybe if you have your Bible with you, Acts chapter sixteen, verse one to five, you can look at this again. Um, the next time I teach this, I think we'll put this passage in here. But if you have Acts chapter 16, verse 1 to 5. Um, no, Frank, you're at work, but do you have your Bible? Yes, I can read. Okay, please do. Acts chapter 1. 16. Acts chapter 16, verse 1 to 5. Voilà. Paul came to Debbie and then to Rista where a disciple named Timothy lived, whose mother was Jewish and a believer, but whose father was a Greek. Yeah. The believers at Lystra and Iconium spoke well of him. Paul wanted to take him along on the journey, so he circumcised him because of the Jews who lived in that area, for they all knew that his father was a Greek. As they traveled from town to town, they delivered the 
decisions reached by the apostles and elders in Jerusalem for the people to obey. So the churches were strengthened in faith and grew daily in numbers. Okay. What were the next steps in Timothy's training? Um, Timothy had faith. Timothy had knowledge. Now what? Circumcision. <laughs> yeah, circumcision. Now, why was he circumcised? Yeah, I think now we are getting into the issue of practical now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what do you say about it, Pastor? Yeah. Um, it, it's like for Paul, uh, he did not want... Um, anything to be a, slum, uh, a stumbling block. Because this time now, uh, Timothy was from a Greek uh, family and they were supposed to be circumcised pertaining to the, um, to the Moses law. What Paul wanted was just to, to clear all obstacles so that he, Timothy would go with him and he started practicing what he believed. Good. Okay, Frank, what do you say about that? Is, is he right? Um, yes, uh, because, because you, yeah, yeah, I think I, I agree with the pastor there. Okay, good. Yeah, I, I agree with him, too, and I like the word that you used, Pastor McQuaya, clearing obstacles. Uh, and I think maybe this was important to Paul, because you remember when Paul started his ministry, there was obstacle after obstacle, and people didn't want to listen to him because he had been a persecutor. And so Paul understood this. We've got to try to clear obstacles because I want Timothy to start preaching now. And to be able to do the work. And so when you find somebody, that beautiful Savior, if you want to make somebody to be a visiting elder, um, number one, make sure he has strong faith. Number two, make sure he has knowledge of scriptures. Number three, as much as you can, try to clear away some obstacles. Um. And that might be part of the training that that you will want him to go through. Uh, let's see what the what the big answer is on this. Um, Pastor McQuay, can you read this in blue? Yes. Based on the recommendation of people in the region, Paul identified Timothy as a good candidate to train as a minister of the gospel. Some might say circumcision was the next step, but we noticed that procedure was not done for Timoth uh, Timothy's benefit, wow. but to remove an obstacle for Jews in their area. Instead, here and for the rest of the trip, Timothy is with Paul, observing his work observing Paul's work in the next step in training. Yeah. Um, one, one thing, I think it goes together with the faith and the knowledge, is that he was recommended by his people, right? Um, I don't know how it, I don't, especially uh, for Pastor Mukwea, as you're coming in now to Blantyre, you maybe don't know people very well. So if you see somebody that you think could be good, now come and ask Frank, because Frank knows the history of people. He knows how they have served in the past, if they have served in the past. You know, get a get some kind of recommendation. That would be good. 
But you'll see in the big answer here used a similar idea, uh, removing an obstacle for people in the area. And then from then on, uh, they traveled from town to town. They went together. So the, the three things to get a recommendation, removing obstacles, and then traveling, being together. Uh, in my in my thinking, I would probably use the word mentor. Can that be the right word? Yeah. Frank, you think that's the right word, or would you use a different one? Um, sorry, a word, another word for a mentor. Yeah. Um, maybe encourager. Could be encouraged. <laughs> yeah, could be. Could be. Um, but you move together. When you move together, that's when you, you really develop uh, your, your minister. Okay, according to 2 Timothy 3, verse 10, what was the result of Timothy's time with Paul? So they spent time together, and they worked together. And, you know, I mean, it's like, it's like uh, also true today. If we spend time together, what do we do? Do we just sit there in the same room? No, we talk. We talk. Mm -hmm. um, we should read first, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 10. Pastor Mukwea, can you read that? You, however, know all about my teaching my way of life, my purpose, faith, patience, love, and endurance. So they spent so much time together. What was the result for Timothy? What was the result for Timothy? What did Timothy know about Paul? Almost, almost knowledge, 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 uh, knowledge and experience in the uh, in the scriptures. Yeah, knowledge and experience. Um, I think uh, I heard Pastor McQuaya say almost everything. You know, um, think about. Yeah, you think about that. You know, one thing that Paul doesn't write uh, in 2 Timothy chapter 3 that I think also Timothy would know about Paul. If you travel with somebody and you work with somebody, you also know what makes them upset, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you just know everything about the person, okay? So what makes you upset? I'm going to be careful. I don't do that. But what is your purpose? Uh, be careful, I want to have the same purpose. I want to have the same faith, patience, all that. Um, so there are things uh, that we learn from one another. Timothy knew exactly how, how Paul worked and what he taught. How Paul worked and what he taught. What was Timothy's role in the cities of Berea and Thessalonica? We should read these passages. Um, Frank, can you read this passage? Or re oh, read okay. this read this answer. We don't have the Bible passage again, but uh, let's read this answer at least. Timothy and Silas stayed in Berea when Paul had to leave. Although the book of Acts does not explain exactly what they were doing in Berea, Timothy was apparently also in Thessalonica during that time, about eight, 80 kilometers from Belia. The natural conclusion seems to be that they were in Berea finishing the instruction that Paul had begun. Timothy then went to Thessalonica to do the same. In conclusion, Timothy was involved in the work of the gospel rather than just observing yeah 
Um, Pastor Mukwea, you might remember when we were with Pastor Holtz up in the northern region, we talked about this thing called dialogue education. Do you remember that? Yes, I do. Uh-huh. One of the keys in dialogue education is to get people to do something. We're not just sitting, we listen to a lecture, we repeat back to you what you said. Ah, uh -uh. go and try it. You know, if we're going to learn evangelism, uh, I will teach you, we'll work together here in the classroom. But now you come with me and you talk to these people. And you do the evangelism and you will learn, oh, next time I'll do it differently. Or this is the thing I did well. Um, do the work and do the work together. Uh, so I think that's what, I think that's what they're trying to say, Berea and Thessalonica. Timothy was doing the work. Very important. Um, ah, sorry, back and forth. Um, maybe, Frank, can you read this question? And then, Pastor Mukwea, you can read the first answer. Of course, we do not have to follow the exact steps Paul used as we multiply ministers. At the same time, it is helpful to see what a missionary like Paul did to train a minister. What are the basic steps? steps we saw in this lesson and what can we learn about our own training method? Pastor Mukwea, what do you, how do you read this? Timothy received the basic instruction at home from his mother and grandmother and from Paul during his first ministry journey, a missionary journey. We can give and build upon basic instruction. Okay. So the first thing we can do, um, understand the foundation that this person has, and then we start to build on it. We start to build on it. How about number two? Frank, can you read number two? Oh. Of course, we do not have to follow the. Okay. Oh, we can. We don't oh, have to read the oh, question oh, again. Number two. Oh, all right, all right, all right. Thank Timothy you. was identified by other believers <clears throat> as someone who had a gift for missionary work, okay. and the poor listened to their recommendations. We can identify people with the gifts necessary for the work, relying on other trusted Christians. Paul did this, and so did the disciples who appointed Stephen and others. Nice. Pastor Mukwea, go ahead and read three and four together. Timothy accompanied Paul and observed the work, learning from Paul's message and methods. We can have candidates observe ministry. Timothy did the work himself. We can let candidates practice ministry. Okay. So in number two, we talked about the recommendations. We should have some uh, recommendations from people. And then number three, exactly what we just talked about, uh, the mentor. We should try to mentor them. And number two, uh, number four, we let them practice. So there are some definite steps that we can take, and it's good that I'm recording this because you'll be able to go back and uh, review these things. And maybe, actually, if you decide to do this kind of ministry, maybe this is something that uh, you could show to the church council or, you know, how how should we do this? Or how what's this one way? It doesn't have to be the only way. How can we do this at Beautiful Savior? Um, question number 20, whose turn is it? Frank, can you read the question? We certainly have a lot of 
freedom regarding curricular methods for learning. There is no specific prescribed course of study. What are some things we we want to keep in mind as we seek to train others? Okay, I'll repeat again on the question. Thank you. What are what are some things we will want to keep in mind as we seek to train others? What do you think? What do we want to keep in mind? Yeah, um, I'll, I'll go back to the three things that we have noticed as we were uh, going through the previous questions and answers. Um, mm -hmm. yes, the background of a, of a person or some matters. Okay. Yes. And then what others say about that person or so matters. Yeah, you, you just say, you don't just say, I've seen a gift, then I'm picking him without uh, asking uh, the recommendation of others. At the end of the day, you pick someone who seems to have a talent, but has got a stumbling block, and the message people will not listen to such a person good yeah okay frank you want to add on i think we, we need also to uh, to keep in mind that uh, we need to be supportive to these people. We need to support them, uh, train them, and mentor them. Good. Yeah. Mentoring them, I think, is one one I would definitely add. Support them, encourage them. Um, I think in the in the mentoring process, also, one of, there are two things that happen. Um, when when I am mentoring you to go to learn how to comfort the sick, or I'm mentoring you to learn how to do evangelism, or I'm mentoring you, whatever it is, um, you will learn about my faith and my way of doing things. But also, I will learn about you. We learn about each other, and we get this kind of a, a unity uh, as we understand one another. I think that's an important piece. Um, I always, um, you know how we have to find people who are going to go to the LBI. We always have a, I think, do we still have a TEE program? We still do yes. that? Yeah. In, in my ministry, when I was in Zambia, and I tried to do this in, um, in Cameroon also, when we do TEE, I tell people, it's not just about knowledge. It's not just giving knowledge and, and teaching that way, but it's also for us to see what is your attitude? What is your attitude? What is your motivation for this? Um, well, we should read this before, I, because I could talk a lot about this. But uh, I think attitude and and uh, the mentoring thing, um, those all of those things come together quite nicely. Um, Pastor Mukwea, can you read this in blue? Just as Timothy was deeply rooted in Scripture, we want any minister of the gospel to be so. It is also important, although we do not say that it is necessary, 
that someone who is going to be a minister of the gospel has observed someone else doing the work of the gospel the way Timothy did when he accompanied Paul in his work. Therefore, as he seeks to train many, uh, many to be ministers of the gospel, we suggest that his training includes these two parts, instruction in the word and observation of the ministry. Good. I think, I think we added another one uh, here and maybe observation and practice of the ministry, maybe they come together in the, the mentoring, perhaps could be. Uh, instruction in the word, I would use the word mentoring, mentoring in ministry. Um, I learned an interesting thing from somebody, I, I don't want to give a lot of details, but <laughs> because it's, it's sort of a uh, difficult situation, but I learned an interesting thing from somebody in the ministry. He said when he was in school, they had a lot of classmates who thought, especially the wives, uh, but the men too, they thought, as soon as I get out of school and I am going to be a pastor, then I'm going to be wealthy and have plenty of money. Well, yeah, I see Pastor McQuay laughing. Yeah, it doesn't work that way. Um, but, and, and what happened was this class graduated and many of the guys left the ministry almost immediately because, well, now I realize I'm not going to be wealthy and famous and be on TV and profit and all these things. No. So the guys left the ministry. So to me, if you don't take time to mentor and to know one another very well. I think that's the kind of difficulty you, you run into, you find. So instruction in the word and observation of ministry. Um, yeah, that's my thought. I, do you guys have any, any reaction to that? Yeah, no, for me, no. Okay, let's go to the next question. How might you, personally, yourself, how might you choose a Bible curriculum to use when training ministers? Kind of a specific question. Um, it's your own opinion. I don't know if there's going to be a right or wrong answer. How would you choose a Bible curriculum? Ah. Go ahead, Frank. How might you choose a Bible curriculum to use when training ministers? Wow, so to maybe this one, this one you have to help. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I was just going to say, this is a difficult question. Um, I think mostly what I would do, and actually I think Pastor Rebke is doing this as he's going and talking with people on this SEM consultation program he's working on, um, is probably start by saying, what do we need? What is it we need? Um, because 
if we're going to train somebody for preaching, we might give him different studies than if we're going to teach somebody to comfort the sick and the dying. Or if we're going to teach somebody evangelism, we might teach him something different than what we teach the preacher. So it depends on what you need. Let's see what the, the big answer is. Oh boy. Uh, it's a big answer. Go ahead, Pastor uh, Mukwea. Can you read this big one? <coughs> Although you could create your own training program, there are advantages to using an existing one. Using the TEL program to train others will save you the work of creating your own program and allow you to share instructional work with the teachers of TEL. We want a person to lead a group on their own to have completed or be working to complete multiplication level. Those called for more limited roles might complete less. Note that a person does not need to finish the entire curriculum before ministry. As mentioned earlier in this course, a person can begin sharing their faith immediately. A person might be called by a group to play a role while continuing their training. Okay. What do you think of that? Use the TEL curriculum to help train people for ministry. Can that work? Yes. Okay. Frank says, yes, I, I think so too. You know, just in my talking with you, Frank, I know we had some classes together, but uh, I, I listened to, and I hope Pastor McQuaya can see this also uh, as we talk and we, we and, and as Pastor McQuaya is working with you, coming close to you, uh, I think maybe he's going to see that you know the Bible pretty well because of the TEL program. And in fact, One Africa team, uh, when we do outreach to new areas, we're reaching out to, I don't know, Burkina Faso, uh, Liberia. One of the things that we always ask people to do, if you want to, if you want to be part of our group, start with tell. And then when you reach a certain level, then we can start to say, okay, now you have some understanding of, of the Bible. We can build on that. So I think the TEL program, I, I think I would agree that the TEL program is quite useful to get started. I, um, yeah, good. Um, scripture instruction classes are important, but what is the next step we want our ministers to take? Okay, so what this thing is saying is, the question is, Okay, you take instruction classes to become a member of the church. Now you add more on top to become a minister or somebody who is discipling others, serving others. What other step should we take beyond instruction class? What do you think? Practitioner. Sorry? Practicing by the way of multiplying disciples. Practicing. Practice, practice, practice. Yeah. Learn how to talk to people. And you learn by doing. That's how we do it well. Frank, can you read this? We also want someone someone to observe ministry in action and practice as part of their training. We want to do the same as Paul who took Timothy on his travel so that 
he could reign by seeing and reasoning. The following observation training plan is a help guide to how to help someone learn a form of ministry. Note that this could help with various forms of ministry, visiting sick, visits of evangelism, teaching Bible classes, etc. Also note that each step can be repeated until the person being trained is ready for the next step. One, I do while you watch. We talk later. Two, you do while I watch. We talk later. Three, you do while I'm gone. We talk later. And four, you do it on a regular basis. We talk when needed. Great. So, you know, I, I like to use the example of evangelism. Let's go on a Thursday afternoon. We'll go together. We're going to visit this person. They have become interested in the church, uh, but they don't understand very much. Um, so I will talk to them, and you listen. We go together. I will talk. You listen. Then we go to the next, the next week, we go to another person uh, in a similar situation. Okay, now you talk, and I will listen. And we discuss. How was it? Did you enjoy it? Was it difficult? Maybe there's something you could do differently. We talk about it. Then the next time, I will give you the name and the, and the contact for this person. You arrange a meeting, you go and visit them, and then you just tell me, how was it? What did you learn? You give a report. And then after that, obviously this takes weeks, months maybe, for the person to learn how to do it. Now, here are four, four names. You go, you arrange everything, you just report to our evangelism committee, and then you will start doing it on a regular basis. So those are the four steps. I will do it while you watch. You do it while I watch. Then you do it when I'm not there. And then number four, it becomes your program. Can it work? Yes. Now see, Frank, you've committed yourself because you said, you think this can work. My next question, my follow-up question is, are you going to do it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's where things get difficult. Good. And that's... It's all... Go ahead, Frank. And now I think it's obvious. It's obvious. Yeah. Yep, I think so. So, okay, yeah, find, it, it's a matter now of finding time to go through all this. I mean, it takes a lot of time. And again, I know both you guys are very busy, um, but it's, this is what, this is what makes the church grow. Okay, summarize what we discussed today about the training of gospel ministers. Maybe you have some two, three, four points that you will remember um, for your people. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, I will say the, the, the steps that we need, I will mention the steps that we need to follow in order to train um, others as ministers. Uh, and the first thing I will say is the, 
a background check. Good. Uh, maybe the person might be uh, studying the scriptures at home with the help of parents, relatives. So that's the first step. Mm -hmm. And the, okay. yes, and the, you also uh, recognize if there are some recommendation from others that indeed this person is capable of uh, being a minister. We have noticed him quite a while, only that maybe he was lacking something, which yeah. is uh, the third step mentorship yes. so we mentor the person train him to be deep rooted into the scriptures then finally you read that person to practice yes. sharing the scriptures with others but they are also as you have uh, taught us at the end, the slot, the slide there, to say there's some steps that also need to be followed when he put those uh, mentorship uh, experience into practice. Good. Good. Pastor Mukoya, what can we add on to Frank's understanding of this lesson? Anything? Uh, he has almost mentioned uh, everything. Yeah. Um, this is not, of course, not an addition. But, I, but I, when I look to what we have discussed today, is um, I can use only two ways to sum it up uh, is in class and on ground. Nice. Yeah, good. In class and on the ground. Um, Frank mentioned one thing be even before class, background, background class on the ground. Yeah, good. Okay. I think we're together. I think you guys are saying a lot of the same thing. Um, great. Um, tell me what I can pray for you, both of you. Frank, what can I pray for you? Uh, Pastor, is uh, about uh, this training that you, whatever we have learned so far, may the Holy Spirit help us to and encourage us to take responsibility to share with others, to mentor others, to train others so that they will also among the scriptures just as you have done to me great okay that's a good that's a good prayer pastor mukwea what can i pray for you all right um for me i'll ask you for two things the, the first one is pray for my ministry as it, it is just beginning in Blantyre. Pray for it that it goes well. And uh, the second thing is um, pray for my for my family back home. We are, there are a number of sicknesses that I have uh, as we noted recently, they have received the, a multiple calls telling this one is sick, that one is sick, this one is sick. So pray for them too. Okay, great. Yeah, both of those very, very good things to pray for. Well, let us pray. Lord God, we thank you for the opportunity to be together and learn again, be reminded again of what it is you want us to do, 
Not that we just get information and we sit with all the information in our head or or maybe even in our heart, we have strong faith. But, but going out with it, now we start to use it and we think about how we can find people to do ministry, how we can um, know their character, how we can uh, build them up even more, how we can mentor them, there are some very good steps, I think, in today's lesson, what we can do. And I appreciate what Frank was saying, that we really need prayers uh, to, to find the time somehow, find the time, and yet also have the same uh, idea uh, all together, all of us together. We have the same idea of how we can make people to become ministers. Let us be disciples so we can train more disciples. Uh, we, we need your spirit to do that. We ask your Holy Spirit also to be with uh, the members at Beautiful Savior, uh, be with Pastor Mukwea, that he's able to bring them what they need for their spiritual life. How are they weak? How are they discouraged? How are they frustrated? Let him know his sheep well so that he can be able to, to, to minister to them and bring them what they need. Certain messages from your word for certain situations. And let him preach well so that everybody is built up in their faith. And yet at the same time, Pastor Mugwea has this uh, lingering in the back of his mind. His family is back home. Uh, people are sick. People are struggling. This is not going well. Um, we pray that you bless his, his prayer life, that he is praying for them, but also uh, his ministry to them, that he's able to point them more to the forgiveness of sins we have in Jesus. Sickness is going to come. Tragedy is going to come. That's part of living in this sinful world. But in the middle of it, we have our Savior to forgive our sins and remind us we always have a home in another place when, when life on this earth is gone. Continue to help all of us to remember uh, these important priorities and remember the work and the opportunities that you give us to do so that we do it for your glory. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Yeah, you're very welcome. I'm wondering about this. We're going to meet on Tuesday. That's all. Tuesday night. About yes. six. About six. Uh, do you both know where La Caverna is? Uh, yes, I know. Okay. Pastor McQuay, have you seen it? No. <laughs> you might have to you might have to use Google Maps. I don't know. <laughs> um, no, but Pastor, I mean Pastor Mkwe is just maybe two hundred away uh, from uh, the uh, uh, church there. Oh, yes, well, just to me across uh, Mandala. I mean Sifao there. Oh. Yeah, Sifa was right there across the street, I think. Is it? Or the same place, same side? Yeah, it's just the same, same, same. It used to be across Sifa. So I think there's some old building that way. They've uh, tried and neutralized where, but I think now uh, that's where the Cavena is. Yeah, no big, no, no big deal. My, 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 my vice president will give me map on Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> very good and then um sure. what i'm proposing if we're going to meet on tuesday i think i'm traveling on wednesday so if it's possible can we meet next week friday again can that be okay uh, ne next week friday um uh, i will not be around you won't that's right yes okay well, let's talk think, about this. Let's talk about this on Tuesday. We can bring out our calendars and see what we can do. All right, all right. Yeah, then it'll be good to be face-to-face -face anyway. 
Nice. Okay. The next lesson is called Just Multiplicate, um, and it's based on 2 Timothy chapter 4. It's only two verses, but uh, we'll talk about that on Tuesday when we're together. Okay. Okay? Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, gentlemen. I am so happy to see you today and uh, look forward to seeing you face-to-face -face on Tuesday evening. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Give my greetings to your family as well. Thank you. Thank you.